Hello, everybody. Welcome back to A Touch More. It's been a hard week Mm -hmm. for both of us, and we imagine for a lot of you also, we are going to get into our reactions um, about the election last week. There was also a lot of women's sports that were happening over the weekend. We're also going to talk about that. Um, But yeah, it was a little bit of a a tough week, shocking. I think everybody's still processing a bit and, you know, sort of trying to figure out um, what happened and how and why and, you know, all of the things. But so um, many rabbit holes. So many, <laughs> so I've many been rabbit down holes. Way too many. Yeah. Rabbit holes. Both of our, um, our personal ways of processing things have come very much to light. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, dissociating and avoiding everything. <laughs> and Sue's and diving right into solutions. Pouring knowledge into my brain. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that. But like Megan said, um, in moments like this, you, you do have to find ways to maybe put a smile on your face or take care of yourself. Um, one thing for us that is definitely true is women's sports gives us that community, mm-hmm. gives us that place to go. So mm-hmm. we're also going to talk a little bit about that. And we'll get into some of our, our regular our regularly scheduled program as well. So stay yeah. tuned. Here we go. Support for A Touch More comes from L'Oreal Paris. Each year, the L'Oreal Paris Women of Worth program chooses 10 brilliant nonprofit leaders to be the Women of Worth honorees. Today, we'll hear directly from a program alum and learn a bit about some of the incredible women from the 2024 honoree cohort. So stick around. Okay, to get us started this week, um, we're just going to talk about it right at the top. Donald Trump defeats Kamala Harris in the 2024 election by a close margin. Um, Which is a good reminder. It is a good reminder. Um, It feels bigger. It does. Yeah. I mean, as pretty much always in, in American politics, at least recently, it's it is like forty nine fifty one at all times. Um, it's basically a, a two point game all the time. Um, yeah, it did feel bigger. Um, I think the House hasn't been called yet, but it is uh, trending Republican and the Senate um, is Republican and the White House will be Republican as well. So that's a little terrifying. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Yeah. What are your thoughts, yeah. Sue? How are you feeling? How have you been processing, processing it this week and just general thoughts and feelings on the election? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the reality that, you know, it's a Trump White House along with um, a Republican Senate, like you said, maybe the House as well. So Republican Congress. Yeah. It's concerning to 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 know that, you know, all the powers that be will be aligned in a sense. Um, Because I do know past experiences tell you that when there is a balance within that, um, when both sides, I guess, are represented, you know, at times it can make things that you want done harder. So that's frustrating. But other times it can prevent some things from happening. So to your point, that I think is the thing I try not to think about. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but as you said earlier, I what I have been doing, my re, my almost immediate reaction was to try to understand more, to try to learn more, whether it's, you know, understanding why people didn't want to vote Democrat this year, understanding um, or even doing more of a deep dive of my understanding of tariffs, of mass deportation, just everything that we've been hearing about the economy, inflation, how these things are impacting each other. Um, that's really where a lot of my response has lived. Almost just, (laughs) it's almost like the athlete in me has kicked in. The more prepared I am, right? The Mm. more I can prepare and be ready for whatever comes my way, our way. So I don't know. That's, that's what's kicked in. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's necessarily serving me. (laughs) So, uh, I think in the last like 24 to 48 hours, I've, I've kind of come off that a little bit. Um, and so like the emotional aspect of things has settled in. Um, and that's kind of, that's, that's where I've been. And I, I, the good news is, I guess, is I have learned a lot. Um, I have extended my education in a sense. I've also seen a lot, you know, particularly on social media. We, we, we all know how 
that world works. And we know that because of our experiences in sports. Yeah. That is an industry, if we call it that, that we intimately know. And so when we open our social media platforms, we know how to navigate like the real from the bullshit or when somebody's just trying to, you know, sow doubt versus what's again real. And so it does, there is that moment where you're like, okay. Like the misinformation of it all? Yes. Or like the. Yeah. So we know misinformation exists in women's sports and there is that mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. We where, just had a full year of it in the WNBA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there is that moment where you're like, okay, this is an industry I know. So I know when, when it's happening. And then you look at all these under, in other industries that you don't know much about and you're like, well, where is it happening there? And that's where I feel like I've tried to further my education. I don't just believe headlines. I'm not just, I'm clicking mm-hmm. on things. I'm reading it. I'm getting other resources to either prove it wrong or prove it right. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be a heavy lift. I'm not going to lie, but that's kind of where I've been. Um, and I know we're going to talk more about that, but what about you? Oh, I think I've been in more of an emotional state. I'm more of a an avoider than you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think to be honest, it's... Well, by so- the way, I'm avoiding... The emotional part. So right. I think we're doing our fair share. Right. We're a fully balanced person um, <laughs> together. Um, I think that I, f- I feel overwhelmed mm-hmm. by the reality that is going to be a Trump presidency, which we have seen before. So I don't feel like I'm saying anything new. But the reality where like anything crazy could happen any day. I think that is really overwhelming. I think that I feel... Not so much personally scared because I think that, you know, we live in very progressive places. We're, you know, unbelievably privileged in our, you know, place in the world and life and, you know, financially and all of these things. But I think that fear extends to, you know, just people in general um, that will be really affected. I'm thinking of like all my trans friends and people that I know and trans kids. I'm thinking about, you know, the potential of mass deportations, if that is going to happen. Um, and just kind of like the general chaos that's going to be sown is really overwhelming and it's exhausting. And we have been through that in um, in a Trump presidency prior. And I think that if the rhetoric and messaging and promises made during the campaign trail, which I personally am believing um, from, you know, that campaign are going to come true then or or at least tried to become true, then it's just it's going to be, you know, a long administration. It's going to be a long four years. And I just like know what it took last time to, you know, resist and to fight against that, um, which we will. And we um, will support each other and do that. Um, But I think it's felt a little overwhelming just to like the thought of going back to that and the thought of being in that place. Um, I think it's really, you know, sad to see that, that message. And I know there's I know there's a lot of, you know, people out there who maybe, you know, voted strictly on their economy or because of, you know, X, Y, or Z. But to see such a hateful message uh, really resonate with such a a large, you know, percentage of the electorate is, I think that's just, like, hard to look at. I think we always, like, know that it's there. I mean, let's, like, not be naive about this. This is America. We were founded on slavery and (laughs) inequality and— uh, someone, you know, uh, one of our good friends who we work with brought this up that the the majority of white people haven't voted for a Democratic president since 1964, um, LBJ, is kind of wild. Um, and just to have reproductive rights and like human rights on the ballot and that not be something that really resonates with people is is hard for me personally to understand. But, uh, you know, I think that that is part of what you're saying of understanding why that isn't resonating for people and and what is resonating people for people and trying to understand that moving forward. But I th- just think this week I haven't really been in that place. So I've been reading a lot of my novels and <laughs> trying to, um, you yeah, know, you watch women's sports, do. honestly, and, um, yeah, distract myself a little bit um, knowing that you know, you can't do that forever, but just trying to kind of let this sink in and to, 
you know, hold space for myself to be sad and to be upset and to, um, you know, be sort of like confused and, um, frustrated by it all. Um, while also trying to be a good sounding board and listening to you and all the information that you're know, um, looking up and giving to, to us. <laughs> there have been times where I'm like, babe, you can talk, but <laughs> like, not to be honest, I'm not going to give anything back. You can put it in my ears. I don't know if it's sticking. I've noticed. <laughs> I've stopped. <laughs> no, you don't have to stop. I, it's it, We process uh, things very differently, mm -hmm. um, which is great. I think it's um, a, a good learning for both of us um, to take from the other. But yeah, that's what we've sort of been... Yeah. One thing yeah, I think we do agree on is that um, especially the first couple of days after the election, just walking around the city, you know, whether mm -hmm. it was on our way to dinner or on our way to get some lunch or from a workout, whatever the case may be, we've actually had a lot of people stop us and a lot come up more. to us. Yeah. Makes me think like how many people are just walking by? How many people are like, <laughs> it's such a weird thing to have people know who you are. When you're just in your normal day, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, this is a whole looking wild from workouts. And I things. mean, God knows why. I just, <laughs> anywhere I go, it's this potential that I'm looking wild. No. Um, yeah, it is a strange thing. But continue. Sorry. Yeah, no, we we've had a lot of people come up to us. Um, you know, more so, I would say, young women, but for sure, but yeah. definitely uh, men mm -hmm. as well. And again, in those first forty eight hours, it was a lot of. I don't know, commiserating, but also hope. There was a lot of hope in those interactions. Mm -hmm. There was like a group of women um, said to us, like, this is a sign. Like, seeing you on this day, <laughs> you know, the day after the election, this is a sign. America's this gonna is giving be okay. me hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, one woman who was a South Carolina grad, I think she said, um, gave some props to Don Staley and started crying when she saw us. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's still, even though it was an emotional reaction, it still was coming from a place of hope. Seeing other people that you know are going through the same thing. That that always mm -hmm. helps. Um, so yeah, we did have some some really great interactions on the street. And it, it kind of reminded me of what you get from sports and what you learn from sports. Because we do, mm -hmm. as athletes, live in a world where there's a lot of losing. There's a lot of defeat. There's oh, a lot of, the time. Yeah. Of, of heartache. Mm -hmm. And it's how you bounce back from that. That really defines who you are. Um, well, how do you say? I know. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to give you no. secrets. <laughs> um, no, I think that is the secret is that there is not one way. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at us talking yeah. about how we've processed. Um, I do think that there needs to be space. When I've lost heartbreaking games, um, you have to have space to kind of wallow in it. Yeah. You got to like feel the feels. Yeah, I think it, I, I do agree. And so I think to it's give permission to for that is, I think, a big part of it. Um, I think, you know, we were talking earlier today about watching film, what that is. So for those that don't know, because I actually was telling somebody a story about film recently and they were like, I literally was done with the story. And they were like, <laughs> what do you mean by film? What do you mean exactly by that? <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. So um, when we say film, it's just watching the video of the game before. Yeah. And coaches, coaching staffs generally break it mm -hmm. up. So for basketball, you're going to watch the good offense and you're going to watch the bad offense. Mm -hmm. You're going to watch the good defense. You're going to watch gonna the bad You're going to look at defense. exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. There's also an element of watching what the other team did or does. Um the does is more so when you're preparing to play mm -hmm. a team. You watch a lot of film yeah. about that too. But in yeah. this case, you know, watching film after a loss, it's hard. It sucks. It's, yeah. it's a look in the mirror. I think we're all having that. Um, there's also hope in there. I think we're all having that when you mm -hmm. look back. Um, but yeah, it's about learning. It's about learning without judgment, but also when there's times to judge, you have to kind of step up for that too and take that as well. So I know it's something yeah. that... Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, obviously the Democratic Party um, missed the mark on some some things. And we need to look at that really honestly in the coming months, weeks, and years um, to try to have this message in this party resonate with more people mm -hmm. than is resonating with the other side, which did not happen this time. I, I totally agree about the... Um, sort of the film or the looking back. You said it earlier. It's like what never helps is like, well, if we would have done this or should have done this, or you know, it's like, well, we didn't. So let's put that in the plan moving forward. Um, 
and kind of like, you know, understand where we can get better, where we, you know, the hardest part to look at is usually like when it's you and you did something bad and you really would just prefer to not watch it. Mm -hmm. Um, But to be able to stare right at it and, um, you know, figure out what happened. But that's how you learn. Yeah. So this actually reminds me of something that Coach Ariyama always said. And it's one of the lessons um, that I probably took with me more than anything from playing at UConn. I would always say basketball is not a game of how to. It's not a game of how to because everybody can dribble and everybody can pass and everybody can shoot. It's a game of when to, when to do these things. And I just think that's something that I've carried with me, yes, in in sports and basketball, but it's also something in life. And you're talking now on like reliving and, and moving forward even. And it's kind of about... You know, it's not about, I feel like we stand, our values, our morals are what they are. And that's why we stand for the things we stand for. But I think it's totally okay to evaluate like, okay, when could we have done something different? Or when could this conversation mm-hmm. have, have been handled differently? Um, I think that is appropriate, not to question your values or your morals, but maybe take a step back and be like, okay, I look back on conversations, maybe with family members or friends, whatever the case may be. And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, how could I have done that? Or when could I have done something differently Mm -hmm. so many parallels yeah so many um yeah I think one thing that I am um well thankful for and also I'm very much reminded of in this moment is women's sports and obviously we're a pod that you know talks about things that intersect whether it's politics culture um you know just our daily lives through women's sports but I've been thinking a lot about just what an utter act of revolution it is that women's sports even exist and that, like, it's kind of a miracle that they're just thriving in the way that Mm -hmm. they are considering the, you know, pushbacks and the disadvantages and the suppression, all of it that women's sports has, you know, suffered from and had to deal with over all of these years and what a really incredible place it is where all of these things do intersect. And and we're obviously going to get to, um, you know, the sports aspect just over the weekend and the NWSL playoffs. Um, but just how thankful I am for that space and that space is going to continue for, you know, this obviously in the coming months and years and, um, you know, through this entire Trump presidency. And I feel like this is going to be a space for us um, and for us personally, but also for fans and people to continue to show up and express who they are and what they care about and the things that they care about and do that in a place that is fun and entertaining and like welcoming and, you know, has a has a very clear shared value set. And I'm just really thankful that we get to do this and to, you know, even just come on and, and talk because it's, you know, it's like... Part of me wants to be here right now. Part of me wants of to, me, you know, just be sitting on the couch and, and you know, trying to figure it out just like the rest of everybody. But um, I think just in general, it's like what other space – and I think it just resonates so much with this election and the rhetoric around this election around, you know, bodily autonomy and the attack of trans kids and, you know, who gets the right to – show up and be a full person and to um, express themselves in a full way. And it's like women's sports and the the sort of arena that is women's sports. I don't know if there's any other, you know, pseudo arena in our in our lives that like women get to show up in the way that they do in women's sports, you know, women's sort of an, an umbrella term that's um, very inclusive in women's sports of non-binary people and trans people. And I feel like there's something really special. There's something really revolutionary. There's something really, um, you know, I think like action oriented and community building and organizing and like drawing people in um, about that space. And yeah, I'm just really excited that we get the get the chance to talk about it and live in it and have lived in it for so long. I think it's like really shaped who I am as as a person and the way that I walk in the world, knowing that that is the space that I came from. Yeah, I think we both have a ton of gratitude right now for the sports community and a ton of gratitude that there was the NWSL playoffs this past weekend. Mm-hmm. And now we're going to get into that. 
Support for A Touch More comes from L'Oreal Paris, who are proudly presenting their 2024 Women of Worth honorees. One of these women is Sherry Mathis, president of the Mammogram Poster Girls. Her organization raises money and awareness for women of limited means to benefit from early screening for breast cancer. A two-time breast cancer survivor herself, Sherry is on a mission to offset the cost of mammograms for women who often wouldn't qualify. She also wants to raise awareness on the importance of early breast cancer screenings. We're also honoring Dr. Tanya Stafford. Dr. Stafford is the founder and executive director of It's Going to Be Okay, a nonprofit supporting victims of human trafficking. It's Going to Be Okay provides trauma-informed services to victims and their children, plus awareness and prevention trainings for everyone from the FBI to airline and hotel staff. These are just two of the many incredible women honored this year, two powerful change makers in their unique communities. So thank you, L'Oreal Paris, for lifting them up and letting us celebrate them. Learn more about this year's recipients at womenofworth.com. The NWSL playoffs started this weekend Mm -hmm. uh, with a bunch of bangers, a bunch of stars showing out. A lot of extra time. uh, Yeah. You guys love extra time. Well, there was actual extra time (laughs) in the uh, Bay FC Washington Spirit game that Mm -hmm. went into overtime, a very um, unfortunate own goal at the end. Um, But shout to Trinity for putting uh, a really dangerous cross in there and uh, forcing that own goal. The Spirit defeated um, Bay FC in extra time, overtime. I don't know how we delineate. Yeah, I was just going to ask that. It's help, help, help me out here. Well, help the rest it, of overtime. us. Overtime. Okay, yeah, OT. But no, it is actually called extra time. Stoppage time. Sorry, that's what it is. Stoppage time <laughs> and extra time. My favorite Figuring thing in life time, is when, you, when, when people come up to athletes and they ask like a question about a rule or a question like, oh, I'm I like, think what? I know. Stoppage time Never and ask extra us. time. So all the games... <laughs> Had stoppage time. One game had extra time. Boom. Washington game had extra time. Um, yeah. Okay. So Washington um, defeating um, Bay FC, which was much more of a game than I think people thought it was going to be. Washington obviously seated very high. Um, I actually heard Lori Lindsay, who covers the NWSL often, talk about Bay FC being on a little bit of a ride. That, that type of ride that sometimes teams get on, a wave, if you will. It's hard to get them off. Mm-hmm. So she was wondering if they weren't going to go in there and, and uh, take down the spirit. And they did not. Okay. Unfortunately. Um, I had my eye on that game because we were already at the Gotham game and it was finishing. Yes. And, you know, we're going to get into— Yeah, we were watching our, it on the TV. Yeah, we were watching it. We're going to get into our thoughts on the Gotham game. But I was low-key, I guess, cheering for Bay FC just because it would mean if Gotham won, which they did, but— if Gotham won, there'd be another home game in New York. Yeah. Well, New Jersey. <laughs> Same time. Um, yeah. So that was like low key where my cheering was going. But, you know, naturally. Yeah. Whoever wins wins. Because of your very clear biases. Listen, for the bats. We all have them. For Gotham's. <laughs> um, but yeah, but we were at the Gotham game. We were at the Gotham game. So do you, do you want to start with your deep dive on what you saw in that game? And then I can provide mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, great atmosphere. Yeah. Um, there was 15 over, plus thousand. Over 15 plus thousand. Mm-hmm. It is um, historically one of my favorite places to play. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. This, yeah. It's do a, tell. It's a great stadium. Um, I, afterwards, you were saying how how warm it gets down there. Okay, even, it even can on a cold be really, day, it can be really hot okay. in there. I thought um, that, isn't that a good thing though? Well, on a warm day, it's not a good thing, and on a cold day, it's a good thing. So I've played there in the summer, and Science, it's brutal. Folks. And then you know, honestly, anywhere that's hot is hard for me to play. I don't handle the heat well. Okay, um, but it's just a great stadium. Um, the pitch is always like beautiful and taken care of so well and it just is like a really proper soccer environment and we've had some um some really amazing games there both with the national team um and in the nwsl with the rain and so i always just like enjoy going there i think it's a great fan experience to be in that stadium and last night was awesome the game was also a little earlier in the day which was nice um a little afternoon setting uh, there was fifteen plus thousand, and they were they were loud and cheering. Um, what did you see from a soccer perspective? Well, I personally thought that 
Gotham could have used a lot more activity from their outside backs. Jenna Knight Swanger did not start the game. I don't know why. Um, she was just away on national team duty, and so it's a little odd to me that she didn't start considering she's Watch yourself. going into the national team and now she <laughs> is coming back and she can't start for a club team, but whatever. I'm not the coach. Um, I thought that it, because um, they're, they're essentially playing four center backs across the back. Um, Jess Carter is more of a center back. Mandy Freeman more of a center back, obviously, and then Tieran Davidson and um, Emily Sonnet. And so I thought that they were missing the space creation that outside backs running up and down the line give you. Um, obviously, Jenna uh, is great service on the ball. She can run for days. Um, I thought it was a little difficult for their front line to get in behind, and obviously they have they have pace. Um, Lynn Williams started the game. Um, Ella Stevenson was, was on the other side and a stare down the middle. I just thought they lacked a little bit of, like, moving um, the Portland – defense around and being able to be a little bit more dynamic up there. So, but they won. They did win. I know. I, I thought the substitutions. I'm like, do you have anything Honestly, I thought this, I will get into the positive. I thought the substitutions were um, really interesting. Um, the game was tied 1-1 sort of in the second half. It's like Gotham got a goal and then Portland got a goal right back. Um, and then both outside backs were subbed out for two outside backs. And then Lynn Williams was brought off, who's a forward and a defensive midfielder who ended up getting the winning assist. Um, shout out to my girl, Roosevelt. I mean, I just love her so much. Um, uh, great goal by them, but that was a more, like, defensive um, sub. But they won the game, so I'm like, well, who am I? I, I just, I am um, curious going forward, A, what the lineup is going to be. Mm-hmm. I would like to see them play a little bit more attacking and be a little bit more aggressive. I think that, you know, with essentially two holding midfielders and, four center backs, I think that they can afford to, um, I think Jenna Nicewanger should start, but um, that's just me. It's really nothing against Mandy. I thought Mandy Freeman um, did a really good job uh, playing on that left side. Um, Rose Lavelle, I thought, was obviously just so dangerous. Um, She brings something that no one else in the league really does. Um, Her ability to just pick the ball up and dribble, her change of pace, um, I thought she created a lot of havoc and obviously got the winning goal. She sure Sue? did. Oh, it's funny you asked. What, <laughs> what were my what takeaways? Were your takeaways? Um, my takeaways were well, I have a couple. One, like you said, it was it felt like a great day for soccer, like weather wise. As a fan, I was really excited that I wasn't too hot and I wasn't too cold because yeah. as an indoor sport person, this really stresses me out when I plan to go to soccer games. Yeah, I'm just it's this just a really. Big thing. How, how many layers? Like, what are we talking? So I was really thrilled for the weather. Um, the snacks at Gotham are elite. They have a whole candy area they do. that I took full advantage of. I was in the gummy bears. What was your favorite? Uh, the Tootsie Pop, for sure. Yeah. Um, at one point, you leaned over me to talk to the people who were with, and you were like, there's Tootsie Pop. There's full Tootsie Pops over there. And there was red ones, and there was, like, blue listen, ones. There was a lot of the red there. ones. And then we were with Merritt, who came in with a major hot take that she prefers the chocolate, the brown ones, that I'm still recovering from that. Um, but I was very excited by They're the snacks. Uh, when we got home, I actually found a Kit Kat in my pocket. <laughs> I saved that for after dinner. Yeah, so you didn't even give me was, half of that, by the way. You, yeah, well, I, you know, in fairness, it was a baby size single joint, so it's like, I'm just saying, it was like I one saw inch and you one. Get it out of your pocket and oh, put, and it, put it like it over on your side, and then where it belonged. Yeah. So that was really exciting. I thought they handled that area of the of the stadium very well. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, a win is a win. I thought Agreed. the post goal music was I was dancing. Awesome. I don't know what it was. You know, I wish if it's like a specific like song. Play music but in the our beat, games. I was like, I like this. More goals, please. Mm-hmm. So I was really into that. Um, and then, you know, my final thoughts are, if you're going to watch a soccer game, do it with soccer players because you guys really, I just said five seconds ago how we don't always know the rules, but obviously the basic ones, like you guys know the rules. So even when yeah. Portland 
um, was it Sophia Smith yeah. scored early in the first game? Half, yeah. yeah, the first half. You know, I had a lot of feels about it. I was like, dang, now we're going to be down, you know, zero to one or what do you guys say? One nil, whatever. And, <laughs> you know, we're going to be down and you and Merritt didn't even move. You're like, Meh, it's offsides. It's offsides. Didn't Clearly. even flinch. Didn't think anything about it. So it calmed me in a way, which I really, really liked. Oh my gosh, you're so welcome. So, That's how yeah. I feel watching games with you. I'm always like, I feel like I have... I'm watching the game, and then also I have, like, the cheat code with me. So I'm like, what's going on here? You have an interpreter. It's yeah. basically an interpreter. Totally. Yeah. It's so So great. that was great. Yeah. So um, those were, like, my main observations. But going to a game, obviously I'm an investor in Gotham. It's really fun uh, to watch games when you're cheering, when you're mm -hmm. into it. So I really enjoyed that. I'm obviously being somewhat kidding about my experience, mm -hmm. like kidding, not kidding. More mm -hmm. than anything, it was a great turnout. It's awesome to see that. Um, I am bummed we don't get another home game, but I'm excited that Gotham is moving on. And I'm hopeful for them to basically do what they did last year. No offense. Tough. I'm going to take a little offense <laughs> to that. Were you rooting for them last year? No. Do you think you put a spell Only on Only half of me. <gasps> Remember I had that jersey? <laughs> A spell on you? Did you think I wanted to be carrying around your scooter for I'm five just months? I'm saying I don't think you thought it all the way through, and I think you put a spell on me. <laughs> Do you think and I then... wanted to be your servant <laughs> for six weeks? I know. You really were great. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, so I was excited. Gotham won. Um, mm -hmm. You did have a chance to check out some of the other games. What, what were your thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, we sat down. We were watching um, Orlando and Chicago, mm -hmm. and I mean— Barbara Banda. I feel like Banda. that's that's all that needs to be. Banda, Banda. But that better be her walkout. <laughs> I mean, if that's not her walkout music, I mean, or her goal I, I music. I think huge for them. Obviously, winning the playoff game. We have talked before just about um, their you know unbelievable season, Shield win. Um, Barbara has been in a little bit of a scoring slump um, mm -hmm. since the Olympics. Absolutely broke out of that. She had two goals, could have had a couple more. Um, she was really, honestly, just like unplayable. Um, they were dominant. I feel like the whole game, they were really dominant. Um, Chicago didn't show up that much. Um, that was a little tough. Um, but I'm really excited for Orlando. Um, and Barbara Banda was great. So, And I'm really happy for Marta, too. You know, yeah. you just— That's the storyline. So yeah, we like, already mentioned Bay FC being on a little bit of a wave. I mean, Orlando might be on the wave, given Marta, that it's her final year. It's Marta. Yeah. Yeah. They got the good vibes and the good juju, and they're a very well-rounded team, and you can just tell they know exactly what they're trying to, to do, do out there. And what about Kansas City? Um, yeah, Kansas City, 1-0 uh, to uh, North Carolina Courage. Uh, Tim Wachowinga, in a not-shocking turn of events, scored again. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really good. Yeah. They're really good. This is a really good semifinal. I know. Well, that's, I mean, it's leading me to ask, is this like a dream scenario for the league, the semifinal? Yeah, I think so. I mean, these are the best four teams. Okay. Um, I think you have a lot of star power. Um, obviously, Barbara Banda, Tim Wachowinga, Rose Lavelle um, are all my stars of the weekend, but also the 15,000 fans at Red Bull. And I know that they're not going to have another home game there, but... Um, I think Audi Arena, whatever the Audi plus the way that they call the venue, was sold out as well. So it's only a train ride away. So hopefully some baddies and some some Gotham fans um, are going to travel for that game. I love it. Now that we're in the the semis, hit me with some some takes on the matchups. Oh gosh, um, we can start with Gotham and and, and the Spirit. I just feel like Gotham just, like, keeps winning. I mean, the Spirit are also winning, and they also won their game. Well, I might argue that all the teams in the semis Well, they are. are they winning. are. They're all winning. <laughs> They're, They're all, all winning. on at least one game winning streaks. <laughs> um, I don't know. There's just something about Gotham. I think that they are pretty versatile and pretty deep, and they just kind of keep finding a way to do it. There's a lot of players on the team from last year, so they have, like— that belief. winning mentality yeah. and a belief. And there's also a lot of new players who have a lot to prove. Um, Spirit, also a very good vibe going on. They're hosting the semifinal for a reason. Um, they have one of, if not the most, you know, dynamic player in the league and Trinity Rodman, who just wreaks havoc all the time. 
So I'm really excited for that. I'm more excited for Kansas City, Orlando, to be honest. These, um, I feel like have really been the two best teams um, in the league all year. Obviously, Orlando, the Shield winner. Kansas City has the MVP, in my opinion, um, in Temo Chewinga, and she just can't stop scoring goals. Um, well, there's been uh, a lot of conversation around Temwa and the officiating around players yeah. playing her, physically fouling her. Uh-huh. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So Vlako Anonofsky, um said in his in his post-game presser that they were targeting um, oh. Temwa. Uh, which immediately, I think, for me and probably for yeah. you, um, we've spent a lot of time Triggered. talking. Yeah, talking yeah. about targeting in the WNBA this year. I, I don't. I think it's being um, said in a much different way. So I just want to say that it did like definitely ping for me. I mean, things that I just like, you know. Th- first of all, I I do think Tim was being you know fouled a lot, and if I was an opposing team, I would try to foul her. Also, I would try to foul her before half field. I would try to foul her as much as possible because if she gets away from you, you're never catching her. And obviously she has, you know, 21 or 22 goals or whatever it is on the season. Like that is like normal. This happens to Messi. This happens to Christian Pulisic. This has happened to me and my teams. This has happened to Crystal Dunn. This is how, if you're great, it's a strategy. It's a strategy. If you're great, this is the only way that you can slow her down. Now, what I will say and what I have said for a long time, anybody who's watched me play and watched me count things out on my fingers, which I've done innumerable amount of times, <laughs> is it is on the referees to understand this as a tactical strategy against that player. So oftentimes what happens is that, say, Temo Chewinga, for instance, it won't be one player who's fouling her over and over and over again because that's really obvious. But it's all the players. If every player gets one foul each against one player, that player is being fouled constantly all game long. So, But if you're that team, you're like, Strategy completed. Strategy completed. Yeah. That's an amazing strategy. Okay. Until you get a yellow card, and until there's another yellow card, mm-hmm. of course, if there's no punishment, you're going to keep doing it because she's so difficult. I mean, it's really like a sign of respect right. and a sign that, like, we absolutely cannot guard you legally, <laughs> so we're going to have to do something else. Sometimes it's against a team in general um, where whether they're really good in possession or they want to play and it's disruptive or some teams are just more physical or that's just kind of their style. Sometimes that happens. Um, and sometimes it's specifically with with one player. Um, I think that's what's happening. I think that teams should continue to do that as long as it's not going to be punished. But also I'm like, referees, hello, this is really obvious what's going on. If they're being very physical with a, um, with a particular player, you have to take that as sort of a team strategy and just give one yellow card out. And then like it basically deads the strategy because the team's not going to want to do that over and over and over again. So that's the targeting situation. Um, different to what we've been hearing about in the W, but sort of similar in that – well, I think we've talked about this regularly in women's sports is that the level of officiating oftentimes is not up to the level of play on the court or on the field. And sometimes that's because the best refs are moving on to other opportunities. So it, it to me, it falls more so in the like investment and um, yeah, I guess just the investment of referees in the league and making sure that they are keeping their top talent to be able to officiate the top talent that is the players in the league. You've talked about this. We've talked about this. Anyways, moving on. Um, Dream scenario for the league, for the final. For me? I mean, I have a pretty clear one. Well, obviously. I'm cheering for Gotham. Yeah. And I'm cheering for Orlando. I think as a recently retired player, Mm -hmm. I can only imagine... I mean, Allie Krieger got to experience this last year with Gotham, not to bring that up again. Mm -hmm. Um, So for Marta to be able to go out with a championship, I I could, I mean, I I wished for it. I can only imagine how wonderful it feels. We can ask Allie one day. (laughs) Um, But I I, I could see that storyline is something that I can get behind, right? Marta finishing her career with a championship at the NWSL, but not over Gotham. No. So that's my dream scenario. No, I want to see it, but not that much. (laughs) <laughs> so a Gotham repeat for me would, I think, be exceptional. Another storyline that that I'm always intrigued by in every sport 
is a super team. Mm -hmm. Gotham this year in their free agency did an amazing job building a roster full of top, top, top level talent. And a lot of people side eye that. A lot of people always, you know, question if a team like that can come together and build chemistry Mm -hmm. having that talent. So I would love to see that play out in a positive way. So go Gotham. Okay. Okay. What about you, though? On a more serious soccer note, I'm like storyline. I'm like the mom that's like, I'm cheering for the red team because it's my favorite color. (laughs) I like it, though. Okay. I'm here for that. Um, I also would like to see um, a Pride Gotham final. One thing I will say, the championship game um, is in a neutral site that this year, and that site is Kansas City. So if Kansas City— What do you mean neutral? They already picked it. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, so neutral site, meaning they just like—it's like a predetermined site. Okay. Sorry. Um, sometimes— No, the, I feel like— The for, higher uh, seed gets yeah, it? Yeah, the higher seed gets it. Maybe they've done that in the past, but for a while now, it's been okay. sort of neutral site or predetermined site, um, obviously different to the um, series that you guys have. But um, that would be cool to have, like, a home— yeah. You know, to have a It's home. the only other storyline that I have even a little I bit know, of a pull towards. I know. It's But cool. then I'm like, isn't that unfair a little bit? Well, I, I mean, yes, no, I don't know. I kind of earned it. Everybody, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, honestly, kind of. But, you know, this yeah. is where we are. Um, but I do think that the Orlando Pride um, in Gotham would be the best game I think it's the best storyline. I think you have tons of stars. I think there's a lot of intrigue. Um, You have the opportunity for, in my opinion, inarguably the game's very best player ever to go out and win a championship. Um, But also, you know, it's nice to play the spoiler for both of these teams. So that would be my dream scenario. And if I'm at the league office and I'm in, like, the marketing department or I'm Jessica Berman or whatever, I'm like, yeah, I want— the biggest story. I want the best story. I want the thing that I can storytell around. I want the thing that the fans are going to be most excited about. I want as many things as I can, you know, sell and be excited about um, in a large way, just like around the whole entertainment space of the weekend. So you're cheering for Gotham? No, I'm cheering for Orlando. (laughs) I'm just kidding. If it comes to that. I mean, I'm not really cheering for anyone. Honestly, I'm cheering. I don't know. Oh, there's so much going on. <laughs> it's hard being retired, huh? Yeah. Well, especially my teams aren't here, you know? Yeah. So then I got to pick other teams, but... What's the teams plural? The Reigns. <laughs> well, my team. My team isn't here. Um, um, so, yeah. So we're very excited to be watching uh, the semifinals this coming weekend. Yeah, um, I'll be locked in. And that takes us to the intersection. Fox Creative. This is advertiser content from L'Oreal Paris. One thing is for people to just have a little bit more grace and and understand that these are people with complex problems and complex stories. For someone experiencing homelessness, access to hygiene products and services isn't a luxury. It's a necessity. My name is Brianna Daniel. I am the founder and chairwoman of Street Team Movement, Inc., and we are based in Orlando, Florida. Street Team Movements is a program that utilizes vending machines that provides hygiene to the unhoused at no cost to them. Each year, L'Oreal Paris launches a nationwide search for 10 extraordinary nonprofit leaders to be named Women of Worth. Each honoree receives $25,000 to support their charitable cause, mentorship from the L'Oreal Paris Network, and a national platform to amplify their stories and their work, and to remind women that they can be the ones to define their own worth the L'Oreal Paris Women of Worth program, it really helped us establish our feminine hygiene program for unhoused women. We have now feminine hygiene kits that would take a homeless woman through five days of her cycle. L'Oreal Paris recognizes the importance and the dignity attached to hygiene, even something as seemingly simple as access to deodorant or tampons. Everyone deserves a shower. Everyone deserves hygiene. Everyone deserves to feel like they're worth the bar of soap and toothpaste and a toothbrush and dignity. Why? Because you are worthy of this. Learn more about Brianna Daniel, Street Team Movement, and this year's recipients at womenofworth.com. This week's intersection topic comes from an audience voicemail. So let's take a listen. 
Hi, my name is Christine, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Sue, I just wanted to let you know that in today's Game of Connections, which appears on the New York Times website, you were one of the answers. There was various names, and you were there along with Big Bird, Lady Bird, and Early Bird. Congratulations. Quite an accomplishment. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Oh, Christine, thank you. I did know. I did know because the you minute did. I opened my eyes this morning, rolled over, checked my phone, I had a bunch of messages telling me that it was up. You did. I actually, so the way it played out was um, somebody had messaged me like, hey, do you play Connections? And then I actually got an email. Hey, do you play Connections? And I was like, oh, I'm in it. And then I like, got a telegram. <laughs> I was like, I'm probably in it. <laughs> so then I opened and I did play on my own. Um, but I do play every day, so that wouldn't have been, you know, this is not different. But I did play on my own immediately. I knew what, what I knew. I knew it was Sue Bird, so then I was able to go. Oh, big yeah, you had a leg up, lady. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you had a <laughs> leg early, up. So I knew everyone. what was up. But yeah, it's um, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's kind of crazy. I've gotten so many messages about it. They all start with, "Hey, do you play? Do you hey. play Connections?" Hey. Um, but it's been very sweet. It's been very sweet to see how many people. I mean, literally from every part of my life. Yeah. It's been like high school friends, childhood friends, WNBA friends, like Your family nieces. members. Um, yeah, my nieces. Well, I texted my sister and I was like, yeah. every now and then we're going to get into our, our own gaming habits. But every now and then I'll play Word All or Connections with with my nieces who are 11 mm -hmm. and 9. Um, to be honest, I don't even really know like if they're playing. It's a lot of. Can you just tell me? Yeah. <laughs> Can I get a hint? I'm like, the whole point is for you to learn. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to play with the older one later. She hasn't played yet. The younger one played already. It's actually like really cute. I've gotten so many messages as well. Um, I am new to connections and I do really like it. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm also talked, like, you're not a gamer. You, can you give me a hint? Um, <laughs> but yes, to know Sue is to know how much you love games and how I much you games. in particular love these New York Times games. Mm -hmm. You play them all with like 20 different factions of people in your life. <laughs> um, so I even feel like... Well, you got to have some accountability. So you got to have people you send them to. I know. Yeah. I, I feel... I don't even know how many people you send them to. I just know Not it's a lot. Not that many. Not that I many. I feel like you're even downplaying um, how cool this is Oh, no, for it's you very and cool. like how much it means Am I downplaying? Yeah. No, it's very cool. Yeah. No, I'm just... I only said that to say like... This is really cool. And for someone who actually like plays these games every morning for so long and with so many people, it's, it's really cute to see um, all these people texting you and all these people texting me and asking yeah. um, about the connections. Yeah, I had someone because um, I've been I'm sure you have too. I've been a crossword puzzle answer before as well. Mm -hmm. So now I just got to figure out how to get on Wordle. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm like birdie. Is that would that count? Maybe, Maybe. point point or guard. I'll, I'll take. I, I'll claim those. Storm. Storm. I'll claim that too. I think there's actually been a storm before. Okay. I want to say storm has been done. All right. So maybe a birdie. Okay. So, oh, that'd be cute. Yeah. Then I can have the trifecta. Um, but yeah, we do game. Yeah. Anyone at the New York Times, if you're listening. <laughs> we do game. It is part of our, our morning routine. I also play mm -hmm. a game called Framed, mm -hmm. where it shows you frames from movies and you get like, I think, six chances to guess oh, yeah. what movie it's from. I enjoy yeah. that one too. I used to play um, Hurdle. Yeah, the music one? Yeah. Yeah. That was, I loved that one. You were good at that. Yeah, I really enjoyed that yeah, one. You're... Spotify took it over, and then I don't, I don't know exactly what happened, but it's it's no longer. That yeah. one I miss, RIP Hurdle. Someone bring that back. Yeah. Hopefully we're flooded with voicemails on other Hurdle games yeah. I just don't know about. <laughs> I'm sure we Can't will Can't wait be. for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you, Christine. I did know, and I really appreciate the love. Yeah. I feel like I won a championship. My phone's been blowing up. It's, yeah, basically. Yeah, like when Sabrina won, and she's like, oh, I have 305 unread messages. That's yeah. how I feel right now. I, I can't know. get back to everybody. When people are like, there's Honestly, no feeling like winning a championship, I'm like, au contraire. As we're sitting here, I'm getting messages. Hey. Do you, play, do you play connections? With, I'm not even joking. With, with, a, screenshot the, with a screenshot and a screenshot circle, and a circle. <laughs> literally around it as if I can't see my own name. <laughs> so cute. No, in real time. Do and, and this is a group chat from of my high school friends. Do any of you play connections? <laughs> Someone else wrote, yes, I saw. Sue, do you? <laughs> yeah. Should I respond right now? It's really cute. That's funny. Anyways, yeah. And now we'll move on. We have another voicemail following last week's interview with Neko Gumake. Let's listen to that one. 
This is Kellen calling from Bellevue, Washington. Longtime fan, first time caller. I just listened to the episode with Neka Gumake, and I was really bummed that she didn't share her Thai place in Seattle. Wanted to see if you could share your favorite restaurants in the Seattle Bellevue area. All right. Thanks. Love ya. Bye. Yeah, Neck is holding on Same. to that one. I know, she's gatekeeping it. She's holding on to that one. I, I kind of get it. She'll give it away eventually. She'll give it away eventually. Yeah, I feel like it's coming soon. She's get After the billions of people that listen to that episode, um, give her flack for it, she'll just buckle under the pressure, I'm yeah. sure. All right, so Seattle Eats. I don't know that I have very many wrecks in Bellevue. I'm just going to be honest. Bellevue to me feels like a road trip where I have to pack a yeah, snack. Yeah, I'm, I'm unfamiliar. It's, so it's a different. Um, it's a different city altogether. Yeah. But in Seattle. But, but, but very quickly, Bellevue does have, and this I'm actually going to bring food. this back to Seattle. Bellevue has great, great food. food. Great food. They have a monsoon out there. They have some of like the, I guess what you would call a chain. It's not a proper chain. But they have a monsoon out there. They have a Joey's, I think, still out there. They have a black bottle. And I'm a yeah. big fan of Black Bottle. So yeah, back to fan. Seattle, I would actually say if you haven't been to Black Bottle in Seattle, that is like, for me, first of all, it stays open late. Yeah. So after games, it was always a good one to go to. Mm -hmm. And you can take, I feel like, a mix of people, like a mix of palettes, and they're going to find something. Yeah. You're going to find something It's great. There. They have good and drinks, it's good wine lists. Mm -hmm. It great stays open list, late. Yeah. Um, Walrus and the Carpenter for Walrus me and is, the Carpenter. is just an establishment. I wrote that down right here. Must. Monsoon. Great. Um, oh, Betty. You know we love yeah, Betty. Yeah, we talked they about the Betty. best fries in the world. Best fries. They're so good. I know. I'm like, where I should we Betty go? I love Betty so much. What's your, what's your favorite? Why don't I give... You know, this is what we'll do. I'm going to give you some, like, genres of food. Oh. And you throw one back at me. Sushi. I mean, Shiro's classic. That's mm -hmm. just, like, a classic Seattle establishment. So good. Um, Katsuya's out there. That's really good. I would say that's probably my two. Yeah, I would say Shiro's for the classicness, Katsuya for um, delivery. Yeah. But I'm going, I'm going, oh, God. So these two are, I'm going Momoji or, is that how you say it? Or yeah. Umi. Yeah. Oh, those places the are The Moonraker roll. Uh, Listen, I don't even, right. I, don't, I try sauce. to stay away from the fried ones, you know, yeah. but at the same time, Moonraker, crazy. Okay, mm -hmm. Italian. Spinoz. I knew you were going to say that. So good. With with like a, I'll put a Tavolata as a as a second second option. I'm not going to. Um, what's your I favorite like Thai place? I don't know. We got to shout out the homies. Rasha. The one, one Nekka said, but Ugh. you know, I can't say it. No, yeah, I do love Rasha for ordering. Rasha's great. legit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those are some of our favorites. Yeah, we have a ton. Yeah. That's a good start, though. Um, so, yeah, we love hearing from you. So continue to call us, 1-833-ATOUCH8, or you can leave a comment on our episode on YouTube. In today's edition of A Touch More, um, Lily Johannes opts to play for the U.S. WNT. Um, she has dual citizenship in the Netherlands and in the U.S. She's recently featured for the first time uh, for the U.S. Women's National Team. She's really young. I think she's like 17 only. Um, I'm really excited about this. I also kind of like love what this says about her because basically what she's saying is like, I'm betting on myself that I'm going to be good enough to play for the U.S. No shade to the Netherlands, but basically this means like this is the best or one of the best teams in the world. And like, I think I'm good enough to play here. Um, she was also like born here, her family's from here, but she um, lives in the Netherlands and plays for Ajax. I'm really excited about this. Um, congrats, Lily, on uh, your, I don't know, selection or um, choice. Choice or yeah, her decision. Her decision. Taking her talents. Um, to, yeah, exactly. She's taking her talents to, I mean, literally, to America. Sounds and, like literally. and we're into it. I think she's going to be a nice little playmaking addition cool. to our midfield eventually. So I'm excited about it. Nice. We don't have this very often on the women's side. It's much more prevalent um, on the men's side. At least it has been for the, the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years. Um, we've had a lot of um, German players that have dual citizenship, a lot around like military bases and mm -hmm. um, in Germany. And then there's been a couple of Mexican-American um, players that have chosen Mexico, that have chosen the U.S. So it happens more on the men's side. But 
Um, we're seeing a little bit more on the women's side. Coco Goff also won Big win. Yeah, the WTA finals. Um, she started her season a little bit rough, so to end her season on a huge win um, is so great for her. I always forget how young she is. I know. Like, she's just been winning for so long, it feels like, and, like, so in our consciousness and just such a star. Mm-hmm. Um, the trajectory of her year is really interesting, and we've talked about it. Not doing so hot at the U.S. Open, mm-hmm. um, but was a flag bearer for the Olympics, mm-hmm. you know? And now to to kind of finish off, in a sense— with this win, she was quoted as saying, there's been a lot of ups and downs. At moments, it's felt great. At other moments, it's felt awful. Basically, a typical year on tour. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that's such great perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, it reminds me of what we were talking about earlier with, you know, how to handle or deal with the election results. If you're feeling a lot of things, there's ups, there's downs. Um, and that's kind of what life is. And, and you got to just stay with it. So congratulations to Coco on her, on her big win. And Sue... Women's college basketball. Is I was back. like, did I win something? Are oh, connections a part of that? <laughs> well, you did win the gold medal <laughs> of connections year. today. I had a great year. Um, you've had a great year, capped off by being on connections. <laughs> Women's college basketball is back. It's back. Sounds to me. Um, yeah, it's so early. There's been um, a couple good games though, but it's so early. You know, the first game I think we mentioned. You know, USC as in Southern Cal played Ole Miss. That is a tough first game. I'm, I'm taking this back a week or so. For Ole Miss? No. For oh. USC. And I would just like to acknowledge that the USC of it all, are we talking about Southern California? Are we talking about South Carolina? It's a We're little bit Southern of a California. mindfuck. Who, th- no, who right calls now? USC? People call you South Carolina USC. Really? Yeah. No. Because you know what it was in women's basketball? It's like South Carolina's kind of been on this national stage now for, I mean, for, for quite a while, to be honest. But when you think of the last, let's call it four to five years— You could just say USC because until Juju got to Southern California, it wasn't as much in the limelight. But now you got two USCs. I feel like that's the only way. You got to keep up in conversation. It's tough. No, I know. I totally hear you. Yeah. And I think like in the world, if you say USC, you're thinking Trojans. But in women's basketball, it's been South Carolina for a little bit. Now it's just a Juju show. No. uh, First of all, they played in Paris. Mm -hmm. Um. En um, Paris. Yeah, let me think. Yeah. That's such a so they played in Paris. Say that? <laughs> and no, it's a tough game for the Trojans because Ole Miss is known for, you know, picking up full court, for, you know, getting after you, if you will, causing a lot of turnovers. And that's just a tough first game for anyone. And they almost got it. They almost uh, squeaked it out. So I'm got my eye on all of that. Okay. South Carolina's had a couple good wins. Mm-hmm. They played against Michigan in a close one. What I'm seeing from South Carolina is, interestingly, they're still very deep. They're still very athletic. They still have a lot of size, mm-hmm. and they have athleticism at those positions, at those post, post spots. But I think what might happen, what I'm getting my little eyeball on, is a little bit of a shift from what we've seen traditionally, which is a lot of the scoring coming from their post play. And that's because they had, you know, Camila Cardoza. They had yeah. Aaliyah Boss in the year before that. And now you're seeing a lot of the point production, particularly in their last game. It's only been two games. So everyone, you know, take that into hot consideration. Here? No, not a hot take at all. I'm saying it's a very small sample size, yeah. but they're, you're getting a lot of scoring from their guards. So I have my eye on that just to see how the balance of their play starts to unfold. Um Yeah, UConn's played a couple games. They have one against Louisville in a couple weeks here in New York. Yes! Um, Yeah, it's so early. I'm not even trying to actually do this. You're literally basing it on two, maybe three games. No offense, but anytime I don't have to drive all the way out to stores or Hartford to watch UConn play is a big win for me. (laughs) Unless we're stopping for pizza. Hate, 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 hate. It's nice, though. Um, Get back to Barclays. Yeah. I think to to wrap it up, it's really early. Those are some of the things I've seen. but stay tuned. I'll have more for you for sure. Yeah, I'm excited about the season. Obviously, this is the first um, non kaylin season, and she's, you know, rightfully so dominated those airwaves for a long time. Paige Vickers, um, you know, Juju being able to step into that spotlight, which is so big now. Um, the platform even bigger than it was last year. I'm just, like, really excited to see how everything kind of, like, plays out and all the fanfare and, like, um, you know, just how popular it becomes. So I'm looking forward to it. And as we said, obviously, like, women's sports is such 
an amazing place and to have, you know, one of the the sort of like marquee properties in all of women's sports be back in women's college basketball um, is a good thing for everyone. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to lie. I was a little... I wasn't dreading coming to do this podcast today, but I knew it was going to be on the heavier side. Mm -hmm. Thinking back already to our conversation around the election, I don't even know what I said, how I said it, (laughs) what got articulated. And I think that actually speaks to where I have been mentally. But being able to come here and just kind of chat about women's sports, kind of shoot the shit, if you will, it's been really nice. So I'm really thankful for for this moment because that's it. That's it for the show. But I'm just so thankful that there are some bright spots right now. Likewise. I think this is, you know, I I think we both just want to say to all the listeners, um, like, we're going to be here. We're going to be obviously in it with you. We know it's a hard time. Everybody's kind of processing through. We're going to continue to talk about how amazing women's sports are and all the ways that it intersects with um, our everyday life and politics. And it's going to be okay. And we're going to all be here for each other. What she said. And that's it for the episode. See you all next week. Support for A Touch More comes from L'Oreal Paris, who are proudly presenting their 2024 Women of Worth honorees. One of these women is Sherry Mathis, president of the Mammogram Poster Girls. Her organization raises money and awareness for women of limited means to benefit from early screening for breast cancer. A two-time breast cancer survivor herself, Sherry is on a mission to offset the cost of mammograms for women who often wouldn't qualify. She also wants to raise awareness on the importance of early breast cancer screenings. We're also honoring Dr. Tanya Stafford. Dr. Stafford is the founder and executive director of It's Going to Be Okay, a nonprofit supporting victims of human trafficking. It's Going to Be Okay provides trauma-informed services to victims and their children, plus awareness and prevention trainings for everyone from the FBI to airline and hotel staff. These are just two of the many incredible women honored this year, two powerful change makers in their unique communities. So thank you, L'Oreal Paris, for lifting them up and letting us celebrate them. Learn more about this year's recipients at womenofworth.com.